we are uh, with us uh, Devji, as you all know, uh, is a, a historian uh, you know, who is, has specialized in studies of Islam, globalization, uh, violence and ethics. He has uh, taught at the uh, New School in New York City. He has written several books and uh, two of uh, these uh, give us in-depth account of uh, violence, terrorism and morality. And uh, you know, one of uh, these uh, books is titled as the uh, terrorist in uh, search of humanity uh, and uh, uh, militant Islam and global uh, politics. Then we have with us uh, uh, Miss uh, Nandini Sundar. Uh, she again is a celebrity, I must say, <laughs> rather I must confess. She is a professor of sociology at the Delhi School of Economics and a social anthropologist uh, with uh, contributions towards understanding of uh, environmental struggles of the impacts of central and state government's policies on tribal politics. She is a recipient of several awards and uh, so uh, we were also expecting Rana Ayub, a well-known journalist from Mumbai, uh, who has recently launched a book, uh, uh, Gujarat Files, but unfortunately she hasn't come and uh, so we have to uh, go with these two gentlemen, uh, the, the, the lady and the gentleman. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, let's let, let's uh, it let's it be ladies first, and I would uh, ask my first question to Nandi. Uh, Ms. Nandi, you have uh, fought against excesses committed by the state uh, on tribals in the name of uh, curbing the activities of Nexalites in Chhattisgarh and elsewhere in Central India through Salva Sujona. Uh, we did face a similar uh, problem in Kashmir where we had Ikwanis who were uh, sponsored by the army and who uh, inflicted terrible atrocities on the uh, people, not only militants and their families, uh, their relatives, but also on ordinary people. So do you see any similarities uh, between the two and, uh, you know, in the context of uh, aggressive state? And uh, what we uh, have seen in Kashmir is all these groups who were very active in uh, mid-1990s, uh, uh, 90, uh, uh, right from 1994 up to 2000, uh, they have almost disappeared from the scene. And uh, people have uh, played a major role in you know in that I mean, uh, they fought against them and uh, there were uh, various human rights groups local human rights groups local pressure groups who fought against them do you see any similarities between what you have seen in central uh, uh, india and in kashmir if one is disappearing in kashmir and uh, you know uh, the situation in your uh, area in the areas where you have worked and has uh, the civil society and uh, uh, people like you played any uh, major role in that? Um, actually, as I point out in the book, there's a kind of circulating prose and practice of counterinsurgency. So they took the Ikwani idea, uh, not just from Kashmir, but it's also been done in Punjab. They have the cats in Punjab, they have Salfa and um, Assam. So this is a very well-tested uh, um, method of counterinsurgency to have surrender militants or uh, other people from the villages who can become collaborators with the police and are then used to identify uh, Naxalites, militants, whoever they've been part of. Uh, so this is something that uh, was taken from other theatres, has been subsequently applied in other theatres. For instance, in Manipur, they took the example of the SPOs uh, in Chhattisgarh, the special police officers who were, many of whom were surrendered militants and started that there after looking at the Chhattisgarh model. Uh, so it's something that, you know, is very much part of what the Indian government does wherever it does, counterinsurgency and internationally as well. 
Has the situation changed for better? It is the same or worse? So in 2011, the Supreme Court um, banned the use of special police officers uh, and uh, the government simply changed the name from special police officers to armed auxiliary forces and they gave them more uh, money and better guns and you know so they're completely in contempt of the Supreme Court's orders and continue to use these forces uh, so really nothing has changed even though legally now they are banned. Right uh, so my next question would be uh, you know has it been difficult, rather dangerous, to uh, fight against these groups the way you have? Um, we know about you know police burning your refugees and you know things like that. But have they gone beyond that? Have they tried to harm you physically? No, I mean I think I'm quite privileged and protected. So, uh, but you know everybody in Chhattisgarh, uh, particularly in Bastar is really, really vulnerable. Just now, before this session started, um, there's a person who, uh, called Podium Panda, who was involved in exposing a particular incident where three villages were burnt and uh, you know people were killed and women were raped. And uh, it was on that incident that the CBI has just charge sheeted some special police officers. And I've written about all of this in my book as well. And I just got a message that the police went to the school where his children are studying and the IB actually and tried to find out about them. And so if they started harassing children in class one and class three, then it's really, really not safe for anyone. When we talk about the aggressive state, is it a fact that the, uh, that the people in power try to seize the situations? to uh, go against their political opponents. I mean, they uh, take uh, the incidents of violence or acts of violence as a pretext to uh, suppress the uh, political opposition. Has they, uh, this been the case, uh, you know, in central India, particularly Chhattisgarh, when you, we talk about aggressive state? Because we are discussing about aggressive state uh, flashpoint in 2016. So are they trying to suppress political opposition? Opposition, uh, you know, seizing the situation on the ground, even if some group or if, uh, uh, you know, some individual indulges in an act of violence and does something bad, and the government finds in that an excuse to suppress the political opposition, to, the, to, to fight against their political opponents. No, I mean, clearly, uh, the whole counterinsurgency is there because there is significant opposition. Uh, from the Maoists, from villagers who've been supporting the Maoists. Uh, but, you know, you find uh, that they've also set up CRPF camps in areas where there is no opposition, where there are no Maoists, and, but where there are mines. So really, you know, it's a mixture of both existing opposition, a desire to kind of just uh, grab land in the name of potential opposition. Uh, so it's a mixture of things. Uh, Faisal, uh, you know, uh my question to you would be, uh, does terrorism and indulgence in violence actually provoke a state to become aggressive and uh, try to harm its own people? Yes, I suppose so. Um, but of course it goes the other way as well. Uh, you might even say that uh, a certain kind of terrorism is intent on provoking violence from the state itself. It requires that, it desires the state to exercise violence uh, in order for its aims such as they are to be achieved. Uh, but I think that the, for India, if you're, if you're talking about, in quotes, Islamic terrorism in India, what I find interesting about it is how far it still remains from the global model of um, Muslim militancy. Um, it is, in fact, almost entirely and obsessively dominated by the nation. That I find fascinating. So if you look at the Indian Mujahideen, the last, it's unclear where they came from and who they were. But say you take the official story as being what it is, um, you know, a, a number of Muslims uh, uh, radicalized in various ways in India. What interests me is how they have, they, they're no longer around, how they strongly resisted the pull of global forms of Islam. But their militancy was entirely about the Indian nation state. 
It wasn't about things happening elsewhere in the world. They didn't refer to them. Uh, so there's something to be said about the way in which the nation state and the, uh, and the ideal of nationalism informs both state violence, but also, in its own way, terrorist violence. Uh, that they both come out of the same categories and forms of thought. Uh, it's only the Pakistan-based militants uh, who display any sign of, um, uh, shall we say, global or extranational allegiance. Uh, whether or not this will change is another question. But for the time being, I think, uh, it puts uh, these militants in a way in an interesting, interestingly similar context to the kinds of things that Nandini is um, writing about. There is no uh, huge difference there. Uh, how much uh, religious bias is playing a role in the states uh, I mean, uh, trying to suppress the movements I mean, which are necessarily political? Separate these... Um, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily... I'm not talking about Kashmir now. No. Uh, I wasn't talking about Kashmir before either. But uh, I don't think they're necessarily political. I mean, this is the problem. We tend to see... You know, there's an old and quite banal narrative about Islam's revival and politicization that goes back to the early 19th century, if not to the late 18th century. And it's modeled on the idea of a Protestant revival and politicization. And everything that ever happens in the history of the world that has to do with Islam is explained and accounted for by this narrative. Surely that can't be the case. How can it be exactly the same history from the early 19th century to today? I, so I think the issue of politicization of Islam is actually the wrong way of looking at things. I think in certain ways, uh, the, the militancy, the kind of militancy that we see today in many parts of the world, but let's take, stick to India, um, is in fact anti-political in nature. The problem with it, uh, with these forms of thinking about or manifesting Islam, is that they refuse to access politics, that they refuse to uh, uh, appropriate politics. So there is a kind of deceptive language of Islamic State and Islamic Constitution, Islamic Republic and Islamic Revolution. Some of these terms go back to the 1950s to 40s and uh, earliest to the 1920s. But even then, you see something very interesting. Uh, these are all movements. Let's take someone like Maududi, the founder of the jamaat e islami an Indian who went then to Pakistan from Hyderabad, from Dhaka. Uh, you know, he, here is a person whose interest, in fact, is in rolling back the state. Um, he wants to conquer the state in the way that Lenin wanted to conquer it, to have it only to have it wither away. So you conquer the state and then you roll it back. Because his desire is for society to run itself, for social self-management. And in thinking in this way, he's actually part of a tradition that includes many people who would not have agreed with him in the least. So it's not accidental to note that Maududi, by the way, his influence is very great so that even the caliph, the so-called caliph of ISIS, in his first speech, quoted Maududi fulsomely. And Maududi is someone who, in his early career, wrote an editorial biography of Mahatma Gandhi. He loved it. Why? Because Gandhi too is about Swaraj as self-rule, not necessarily the rule of the state. Individual self-rule, social self-management. Uh, so this desire can go in an anarchist direction, it can go in a kind of communist direction, thinking about the withering of the word the state, and it can go in an Islamist direction. And that bit of Islamism, I think, is what has been inherited by many uh, uh, militant groups of whom Maududi himself would not have approved, as he would not have approved of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the caliph, who quotes him constantly. So I think the problem is the opposite of the one we usually uh, think about. Uh, the problem is a lack of politics rather than its excess. When we talk about uh, Islamic terrorism, unquote, how serious uh, the problem is for India? I don't think at the moment it's particularly serious. I mean, even, you know, we are told about these uh, young men from Kerala who have gone off to uh, the Middle East. Uh, as far as I can tell, of course this is quite unpredictable, but as far as I can tell, their aims have nothing to do with India. Uh, you know, they, they're interested in what's happening in Iraq and Syria. And there, 
the big fight is actually, unlike say Al-Qaeda, whose enemy was clearly the West, whose chief enemy. With ISIS, the enemy is internal. It's internal to Islam itself. And it's first given the name of the Shia, but it doesn't stop there. Every kind of Muslim uh, who uh, they don't like, who they think is not a proper Muslim, is tarred with the same brush. Uh, and so it's a kind of militancy that turns inwards and brings the violence inwards, conceptually as well as in real, in real time, as it were. Uh, so these figures too have been, uh, in my view, um, uh, captured, if you will, by that narrative internal to Islam itself, as opposed to being about the West or you know, Hindus or whatever. Uh, there are, of course, militants who uh, are um, uh, interested in um, India. Uh, and as I said, these are very often the Pakistan-based, Lashkar Taiba in particular, which is dedicated to it, which is entirely obsessed by and defined by India. But when you look at their vision of themselves, it's, it's, it's fascinatingly bizarre. So the Lashkar Taiba has a map of a future subcontinent. And it's a map that looks almost exactly like the maps that had been produced by uh, Chaudhary Rahmat Ali, who was the founder of the idea of Pakistan, of the term Pakistan. He used to produce these strange maps, the continent of Dinia. Dinia, Dinia means religion. But Dinia, of course, is India, the word India with letters transposed. Uh, and the continent of Dinia included uh, all, so it was British India, and what you had were Pakistan, which is roughly where today Pakistan is. There was Bangistan, which is Bangladesh and West Bengal. Then you had all the Muslim princely states, uh, Hyderabad, Rampur, etc., uh, Bhopal and Kash uh, Kashmir. And then you had something called Akhutistan, Dalit homeland, and you had Dravidistan, Dravidian homeland. So you had a complete balkanization and fragmentation of India. Uh, and that's what uh, he envisioned the future of India was. That is to say, in India in which there was no longer a majority, but no longer a minority either. Right? It was completely fragmented in this manner. The Lashkar Taiba has almost the same kind of map. What their vision of the future is not one of India rendered into a territory of Islam. It's this kind of entirely dispersed thing. So there's this kind of strange throwback uh, to these older ideas, uh, but whose aim again is fascinating because it's about fragmenting, morsalizing, and therefore destroying the threat, what is seen as a threat, uh, and in doing so, making possible friendship. Uh, and it's uh, uh, so even there, even though the Lashkar, you know, claims now to be, of course, it's taken on a different name, allied to ISIS, its ideological underpinnings are still exclusively Indian or South Asian in provenance. And its view of the future in South Asia is not a global Islamic future at all. So, uh, uh, when we talk about these groups or the idea, uh, the whole idea of uh, Islamization and things like that, so how much the internal uh, conflict within these uh, the various groups and you know, these are, yeah, I mean, when you talk about the different sects of Islam and the different sects of Muslims, how much does it affect the, the, the overall dream, if you, we may call it a dream, of these groups? Are there any internal conflicts there and which are just destroying this entire dream again, quote unquote? Uh, or uh, the ISIS is uh, heading towards uh, achieving what it is, uh, it, 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 what its goal is. I mean, if you look at ISIS, uh, it's basically made up of a series of warring, ethnically defined armed groups, right? So the Chechens fight against the Somalis, who fight against the Afghans, who fight against whoever, uh, and it's completely hierarchical. So the Western figures who come to join, who have certain skills at the top of the totem pole and the rest are at the bottom with the actual local people in Iraq and Syria at the very bottom. Um, it's, uh, it's so, 
it's a bunch of, you know, what we used to call warlords in Afghanistan. Or when you look at civil war type situations in, in Liberia uh, and other parts of Western Africa, it looks a bit like that. Structurally, there are a lot of similarities. In West Africa, too, you had the creation of these bizarre state-like entities with child soldiers uh, funded by diamonds or minerals, just like uh, ISIS is funded by oil. Right? Uh, so it's in that sense, it has a number of structural similarities with other kinds of situations uh, around the world. Uh, it cannot hold together. In terms of militancy elsewhere, and forget about militancy, in terms of Islam itself, my view is that this category, which in its modern form has only existed since the 19th century, is today in the process of coming apart. I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think, and I was saying this in the inaugural session the other day, I think that it will mean a great deal of trouble in the short run. It's not just Shia and Sunni, it's a whole load of other things as well that are happening. The ideal of Muslim unity is illusory, it's a fool's errand. Uh, and you know, one can be Muslim and not have this ideal. The ideal itself is cracking. Uh, and the ideal itself comes from, its sources are very interesting. When you think about Islam today, you think to the category, almost everyone, from Muslim clerics to American journalists, thinks about it in a curiously similar way. So you have a combination of theological uh, fantasies on the one hand, and on the other uh, categories such as statistical categories, such as demography and cartography. So you think in terms of something called the Muslim world. This idea of the Muslim world is the 19th century and the earliest. No one had any notion of it. The word Ummah, we normally translated as Muslim community, global Muslim community, had no demographic or cartographic reality in the past. It was a juridical category. It was about your status in law. It was not about counting how many Muslims there were and where they were distributed in the world. In my view, and this is also the work of the uh, Turkish historian Cemil Aydin, the idea of the Islamic or Muslim world is modeled upon that of the great European empires, like the British or the French, which are truly global, they were scattered around the world. The Muslim empires of the past were entirely contiguous, like the Ottoman Empire. They were land empires. They just spread from one place to another. And there was more than one of them, generally. But with the British and the French, to say nothing of the Spanish, and the, but mostly it's British, um, you have another vision of polity, and that forms the basis for this idea of the Muslim world. So you can see why it's an unsustainable idea and why it's coming apart today. What is to replace it is the big um, question. These movements are transient ones. ISIS, I was saying again just earlier in the last panel I was on, Al-Qaeda, we were told, was a multi-generational problem. It came and went in 10, within 10 years. ISIS, even shorter term. Uh, we don't know what's going to come in, you know, in the future, but it, um, the, it Many possibilities are open, I think, and and yet those possibilities uh, may go, they, can, they may go in different political directions, but they could also have very similar sets of ideals and objectives, uh, similar forms of similar forms of mobilization, uh, for instance, uh, similar ideas of the, of what it means to live in, in a global. Area. Uh, one last question to you is, uh, we have come across a number of stories, including investor media, and social media is full of uh, such speculations that uh, ISI is a creation of Israel supported by the United States, and now India is also trying to take advantage of the situation and you know trying to get, create that kind of uh, fear psychosis. Um, uh, you know, the sports of the present dispensation in India. So, uh, you must have worked on that also, or you must have some uh, information on that, whether that's true or not, or whether that's based on some uh, facts, or is it just the hearsay? Conspiracy theories are always the passion, but I would, it's true that the leadership crisis comes out of one particular prison camp, American prison camp in Iraq, Camp, camp Boka, right? That's where all these guys meet up, Abu Akhra, Baghdadi, and friends, and they plot this thing. On the other hand, that's not a sufficient explanation, because it's clear it has global appeal. Uh, and, you know, 
ISIS is the first and only such organization, militant movement, uh, which has such a high percentage of uh, votaries who come from around the world who are not linked even to the Middle East, but not only that, of converts, 25% of ISIS recruits, so we are told, are from Iran and are converts. They have no Muslim background. They're converts, the Afro-Caribbeans, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, white Americans, and, uh, you know, one of the chief figures of, of an early video was a Chilean convert. So what's happening, this is clearly not something to do with, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, 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 born and, you know, bred, and, you know, form of Islamist ideology that has been sort of festering there for decades and decades and centuries and centuries. If some Chilean guy from a Roman Catholic background converts to Islam and goes and joins ISIS, you can see that it's a truly global phenomenon. What is happening uh, is not the return to some genealogical origin, but the destruction of these gene genealogies and these origins themselves and their dispersal across the global arena. Um, so, um, I've, so, I'm sorry, I've lost track of your question. So I was asking, I, mean, uh, I was talking about social media, which is full of speculations about uh, oh, yes, India, and uh, India is also now trying to create psych fear psychosis, uh, uh, you know, after talking about uh, these groups, or particularly ISIS, uh, that it's a threat to India, or it's a potential threat to India. So, uh, that was my question. Well, I... You know, it, it's, a, it's these kinds of phenomena attract from all around the world uh, semi-accurate or entirely spurious claims. Um, and that's in part, I think, because whether it's states or other movements, they all somehow realize that these forms of militancy serve as uh, uh, ideological vehicles, or vehicles better of advertising. You can always scare people by claiming ISIS is neighborhood. But that attempt to scare people also betrays, I think, a realization that the threat is not in fact a real one. It might be a real one in terms of a bombing here or there, or radicalization of certain people, but it is not really in any existential manner. No established state uh, country uh, is vulnerable existentially to any of these movements, not neither ISIS nor Al Qaeda nor the two of them put together. There is no way in hell that they can threaten the sovereignty of the United States or India or any country. And they can, perhaps, in these civil war torn situations like Iraq or Syria, but even there, they, have, they haven't succeeded. Uh, so. And that recognition, I think, makes for a politics of proxy battles and proxy wars. That's why, do you think Turkey and Saudi Arabia like uh, what ISIS, that ISIS is as much against them as against anyone else? But they'd be perfectly happy in funding them for their own regional and uh, international ambitions. Uh, it's a very self destructive thing to do, but it's also a set of acts that, that betrays us as the recognition of the limited nature of the threat. Uh, and yet it is a deluded and foolish um, uh, uh, set of actions as well. So, uh, you know, what you have discussed in your book, and, uh, you know, do you see any of the forms of uh, state aggression in the, in the part of India where you have worked, I mean, beyond what you have already discussed in your book? No, I think my book is the last word on state aggression in this <laughs> So, um, but I just want to actually come in on this question of um, state structures and politics. And I think one of the ways that it might be interesting to look at this issue is the relationship of different rebel groups to the idea of the state. And if you look at the Maoists, for instance, they do have an idea of a parallel state. It's not, which is quite different from the kind of uh, Islamist idea of which you were talking about in the state. Uh, withering away to provide some kind of ethical underpinning. So although there is a sense of that Maoist state would also be underpinned by certain ethical practices, uh, it is also a kind of conventional state that 
is being proposed and practiced in certain areas. And I think it would be quite interesting uh, to look at the different kinds of political projects that different groups uh, in the country have vis-a-vis -vis governance structures. I mean, there is a lot of work on rebel governance, uh, how particular areas are marked, so you know, whether it's the Taliban or whatever their state project is, the practice of taxation, punishment, etc., as forming proto-states. Uh, in a sense, is something that perhaps could be, you know, looked at much more in a comparative perspective. From my Kashmir experience, I have seen groups like Ikwanis, uh, not only uh, killing people, abducting them, torturing them, but they would also lay their hands on the resources of the state uh, and uh, the public properties. I mean, uh, private properties. So uh, some of them are now I mean, they are no more active, but they have got huge wealth and special houses, uh, fleet of uh, luxurious cars, uh, and others. have the next likes also done. I'm sorry, these uh, these the groups which are active in central India, particularly Chhattisgarh, also indulging in such kind of acts. Yeah, that's when all the black money is. Maybe Modi should be chasing the equalities and the um, Salvatore leaders rather than um, lining up poor people who are. So one of the big things that's happening with demonetization is that villagers who don't have bank, I mean, nobody has bank accounts in those kinds of areas. Even in the Northeast, uh, I've been hearing about people walking 200 kilometers to you know the nearest bank. So what's happening is that people um, who go and deposit all their money are being accused of being conduits for the Naxalites and um, you know, nobody is being allowed to basically deposit their own money. So really, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very common feature that groups which are supported by the state get money. But the question is really how everybody else is being prevented from having any access to money. Have you come across any instance uh, wherein uh, the authorities or the security forces or any government agency created a group, an outfit, to indulge in, uh, you know, wrongdoings or uh, doing some nasty things to blame the next lives for them. You know, again, um, this practice of using decoys or what are, you know, uh, fake soldiers. I mean, so it's it's again a very common counterinsurgency practice across the world. So. Certainly, I mean, I've come across cases where people pretending to be Naxalites have gone in. Uh, so just to give you one example, um, they went to one village and pretended to be Naxalites and said, you know, uh, when did you go to the last meeting? And once the person sort of thought that they were Naxalites who had come to call in for a meeting, then they arrested all of them because... So, that, I mean, that's a really, really common. Uh, you find it in Guatemala and El Salvador. I mean, you know, wherever actually counterinsurgency is practiced. So, yeah, it's... Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, anybody has any questions, please. So in this country, we have unique uh, positioning. Uh, they are minority in India, but uh, they are a global majority. Similarly, Hindus also, because they are globally a minority, but uh, India, they are the majority. So, uh, how, so it's, I think, I feel the Hindus are written because of the global position of Muslims, number one. Number two, um, to profess a faith, normally we go by birth. If you are born in a Muslim family, you are naturally considered Muslims. Same is the case with every religion. Do the Muslims have a worldview of professing a faith? by learning it, by practicing it, or merely by birth. Because uh, I don't see any conversions from Islam to any other religion, though they have their different cults. But whereas the conversions take place in other religions very frequently. No, I think they are conversions. Um, there is an increasing spate of conversions, well reported in the press, among refugees from Syria to Christianity, once they get to Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, there are increasing numbers of atheists among in Muslim communities. Uh, you know, I was in Saudi Arabia last year uh, uh, for a conference, believe it or not, and um, I was told uh, that by irate princess that um, there were at least 18,000 
professed atheists in that country, despite the fact that the punishment for atheism is death. Uh, so imagine how many more they could be. There are also repeated conversions between sects in Islam. So to, in places which are not, in, in, in situations where there is no material lure. You know, we tend to think of conversion as people converting because they're getting something out of it, which is the usual narrative in India. Uh, but to convert to uh, Ahmadism in Pakistan, or to Shi'ism in Pakistan, particularly, it might get you something, but not very much. It might get you something at a local level, and might be something negative at the national level. So there is that. Muslims are not, in fact, I mean, they're not a global majority. They're, uh, you know, they're the sort of number two religion, as it were. But there is no united Islamic anything. And what we are seeing today is the fragmentation, complete fragmentation of, the, of that category. So it's true that in Indian politics there has been this issue of majority and minority. And when I was mentioning the Lashkar e Taiba thing, in a way that's a kind of strange hope of a time when there were attempts in India in colonial times to try to think about the country and its society in ways that were not numerically defined by majority and minority. Right? This was not just the task of Muslim leaders, it was also that Ambedkar uh, adopted this as well. Right? So the famous Minorities Pact at the Roundtable Conferences was all about this. Uh, and Ambedkar then lambasted Jinnah later on. It's like he's abandoned, once he announces Pakistan, he has abandoned all the Indian minorities. The point of the Indian minorities, the Minorities Pact, is to say, take it together. Uh, the minorities come up to some ridiculous number uh, of the Indian population, uh, and um, uh, which means that the caste Hindus are more a plurality, not a majority. So there's no majority and no minority in India. How do you think about a political future in those conditions? I want to also come in, maybe we should think of Muslims being converted to Hinduism de facto by the caste uh, divisions among Muslims and among Christians. So, you know, in practice, uh, they're extremely Hinduized. Yes, in fact, I would say that the... Uh, the it is not... Uh, the, it doesn't have a religious sanctity. Yeah. In Hinduism, it has a religious sanctity. Religion uh, recognizes the division. Whereas in other religion, in uh, Christianity and Muslim, it is not uh, that the religion sanctions it. There is no sanctity. But in Hinduism, there the, the, the promotes sanctity of the caste. But that maybe, is the difference between the uh, other the religion. religion. Uh, yeah, but then maybe we should start thinking about caste not just in religious terms, but as a larger principle of stratification and discrimination. So uh, even within Islam, there could be ideas of purity, etc. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking that we really do need to complicate our ideas of both caste. And if you're not allowed to use the general graveyard, whether your religion sanctions it or not, it's not particularly useful when you're being laid to rest. We will have a space to protest. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we have a place to protest in Hinduism too. Go ahead. This might be a slightly naive question, so please forgive me for it. But uh, I've always been curious to know what the disintegration of the Ottoman Caliphate has. I mean, has it led to? I mean, is it responsible in part for the rise of sort of fundamentalism in Islam? That's a big question. Yes, I guess in a way. Um, in a way, the problem was that. It was the you know as during the Khilafat movement in this country both. Hindu and Muslim leaders recognized that the fragmentation of the Middle East meant that there was no great power any longer uh, there. Uh, and all you had were little states that were incapable of grounding um, uh, Islam, let's say, uh, in the way that the Ottomans had managed to do with it. Um, and so you have a situation in which Islam becomes ungrounded on the one hand, and on the other hand, Muslim thinkers, with the decline of the Ottoman Empire, but I don't want to fetishize that too much, what you see among many, if not most Muslim thinkers of the 20th century, this extraordinary thing, a refusal to inherit the political language of the past. You know, say in, say in Europe, you have ideas of royal prerogative and sovereignty that translate to popular sovereignty. With modern Islam, with Islamism rather, you have a, but both among modernists and Islamists a refusal to inherit and to develop and to elaborate upon 
the political categories uh, that had existed uh, with Muslim empires and kingdoms and all that. You see this even in India. Today in India, the Prime Minister still goes and stands on the ramparts of the Red Fort. There is a kind of a public acceptance of the Mughal inheritance in that way. In Pakistan, never. The Mughal is out, not even Aurangzeb. You know, there is no inheritance from the Muslim political past. It must come entirely from something called Islam, which is an utter abstraction. And that, in a way, has led to the loss of political language, which is why I said earlier that the, that the ideal is an anti-political ideal. And it's this refusal to develop and to think about politics as a category, I think that um, is a, a crucial one. And the decline of the Ottoman Empire is simply one side of that. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Professor.